Hey guys, Dr. Brandon Crawford here. I'm the founder of the Austin Center for Developing Minds. Uh, we are located just north of Austin, Texas in Cedar Park. And what we do is we focus on developmental functional neurology. Hopefully you'll have a chance to catch my lecture because I'm going to be taking you through what that process looks like and why it's so important to focus on rehabbing the brain in the right way uh, at the right time with the right frequency and oscillations and all this kind of stuff, right? So I'm very honored to be a part of this conference. Uh, this conference is very meaningful. I love all the people involved and obviously the cause is fantastic. So thank you again and I look forward to seeing you soon. Hey everyone, Dr. Brandon Crawford here. So I am co-founder of the company Shed Light. Shed Light is a company that focuses on the use of laser and light therapy to improve the health and wellness of the brain and body. Um, we're happy and excited to be a part of this uh, conference. And so, you know, if you have any more questions or want any information regarding how laser and light therapy can improve your health, please check us out. Go to uh, shedlightcoldlasers.com. Thanks. All right, it looks cool. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Marissa, and I'm presenting today with Brittany. We're both registered behavior technicians at Spark Learning, and today we're going to discuss some strategies to help your child be more independent and strategies to prevent challenging behavior. Um, so while the main focus of our presentation is going to be preventing challenging behavior, we are also going to touch on um, what to do when these strategies don't seem to be working and how to manage those challenging behaviors. All right, so what is ABA? ABA stands for Applied Behavior Analysis, and it is the science of understanding behavior. It is the leading evidence-based treatment approach for autism and other developmental disabilities. Um, every intervention that we put into place has been proven to be effective through research, and there are um, several different applications of applied behavior analysis. So sports and athletic training, so that involves shaping and reinforcing form and increasing motivation during strength training. OBM, also known as um, organizational behavior management, uses ABA principles to increase employee performance in the workplace. Uh, marketing. Marketing uses applied behavior analysis in manipulation of the environment to make items more appealing to consumers. And classroom management uses group contingencies to improve instructional control in a classroom setting. Okay, so ABA is a fairly young science and the initial research was in 1968, specifically in applied behavior analysis. And this is when the guiding principles of ABA were established and the original approach developed called discrete trial training um, was also developed and is still used today. In 1973, this was a big time for ABA. Dr. Lovas conducted a study showing long-term treatment outcomes for children with autism. And he determined that 40 hours of intensive ABA per week was the new standard for treatment. This was a huge study and really um, made ABA known in a more widespread way. Uh, throughout the decades, other researchers have replicated Lovas's findings, all with similar results. Between the 70s and 90s, this is when colleges started to provide coursework specifically in ABA, and schools started to embed these strategies into their classrooms. Smaller credentialing organizations started to take form, and anyone could call themselves an ABA therapist. It became clear at this time that there needed to be more oversight in the field. So... In 1998, the BACB was created, and this is the credentialing board for RBTs, Registered Behavior Therapists, and um, Board Certified Behavior Assistants, and Board Certified Behavior Analysts. Um, 
it is still currently the most predominant certification board overseeing ABA, and it was created to pr protect families and children by upholding ethical standards. In recent years, regulations have gotten stronger for all who can practice ABA. The RBT credential was created and behavior analysts are now required to be licensed. So what is behavior? Let's start talking about that. So not just challenging behaviors, but behavior in general. Behavior is anything a person says or does, um, and a behavior is classified as being observed and measured. Almost all behavior is learned. We are born with behaviors needed for survival, so that would include food, um, thirst, comfort for pain, things like that, and we don't know something is going to be reinforcing or punishing until we experience it. So reinforcers, when we refer to reinforcers without this, throughout this presentation, a reinforcer is something that is uh, likely to increase a behavior and a punisher is something that would be likely to decrease a behavior. So outside of those behaviors we're born with, all other behaviors are learned and they exist um, because they're in our skill repertoire and are being reinforced. So as we're talking today, keep in mind, almost all children's behaviors are learned. In ABA, we examine behavior and look at ways to increase skills we wanna see. So uh, we wanna increase social skills, language skills, play skills, and self-help or independence and decrease behaviors we don't wanna see and always finding replacement behaviors for those um, ones that we wanna decrease and with more appropriate and functional skills. For example, um, if a child might engage in self-injurious behavior when frustrated, we would teach a replacement behavior that would decrease the maladaptive behavior and increase functional skills, such as expressing the emotion. In order to determine how to increase or decrease a behavior, we have to look at why a behavior is occurring. We do this by looking at the ABCs of behavior. A is antecedent, what happens immediately before the behavior. B is behavior, so something you see um, that you can observe and is measurable. And consequence, what happens immediately after the behavior. The antecedent sets the stage for the behavior to occur and the consequence either reinforces, so increases the likelihood of the behavior occurring again, or punishes, decreases the likelihood of the behavior occurring again. Um, so some examples, just some pretty easy ones. Um, an antecedent might be that you walk into a room where the lights are off. The behavior is that you flip the switch and the consequence is that the lights are on. Um, another example, uh, the antecedent being you open your computer, your email is logged off, so you can't check your email. The behavior is you log on to your email, so the consequence is you now have access to your email. And now I'm sure with COVID and working from home, we have tons and tons and tons of emails that we need to check. Um, another example, the antecedent is the driver gets in the car and doesn't put the seatbelt on, um, so the car starts beeping. The behavior is that you put your seatbelt on and the consequence is that the alarm stops. When the consequence occurs several times, patterns of behavior are learned. So for example, um, now when I get in my car, I immediately buckle my seatbelt so that I don't have to hear that beeping noise. Another example might be um, if a kiddo drops his lunchbox and keeps missing the bucket it go, it's supposed to go into instead of putting it in the first time, um, because the first couple of times it happened, mom and dad laughed or thought it was funny. So now he gets that attention every time he just drops his lunchbox. Um, so the antecedent is now um, kind of walking in and um, not having your lunchbox in the bin, um, you throw it on the floor and you kind of get that reinforcement of someone laughing or thinking it's funny. So you're more likely to kind of just throw it on the floor. Um, so here's just another example, antecedent, you're late to work, the behavior is you speed, so the consequence is you get a ticket and you're even more late. Um, so that would decrease your likelihood of speeding um, if you got a ticket. 
So in another case, your antecedent is you're late to work, you speed and you make it to work on time. So that might increase your likelihood of speeding. All right, so I encourage you to take some time to think about behaviors that you might engage in daily and what are the antecedents and consequences of those behaviors. It's important to always think about why your child continues to engage in a behavior. Um, so behaviors you want to see and behaviors you want to go away. What is reinforcing and what's maintaining that behavior? Um, has there been a time that you've been unsure what the behavior is functioning as? Um, so here are some examples we have on this slide. So Max cries when his mom says no ice cream. Max continues to cry louder and louder. Mom can no longer handle the crying and buys Max the ice cream. Max stops crying and mom and Max check out. Um, another example, Max cries when his mom says no to ice cream. Max continues to cry louder and louder. Mom continues shopping and checks out without buying the ice cream. Max continues to cry in the car and eventually falls asleep. So in this example, the crying is being punished by not reinforcing it with ice cream. As you can see, mom did not buy the ice cream this time. Um, so dad is on the phone talking. Connor starts screaming. Dad puts down the phone and yells at Connor. And dad resumes his conversation and Connor resumes screaming. In the next example, dad is on the phone, Connor starts screaming, dad continues his conversation on the phone, Connor eventually stops screaming and starts playing with Legos. So um, thinking about those examples we just read, um, where we start to think about the functions of behavior. Um, so using information we gather when we look at the ABCs of behavior, we're able to identify why a person is engaging in a specific behavior. There are four main reasons why someone might engage in a behavior. Um, so escape or avoidance, the individual behaves in order to get out of doing something that he or she doesn't wanna do. Gaining attention, so the individual behaves in a way to get focused attention, um, whether it be from parents or teachers or siblings or peers or other people that might be around them. Gaining access to a tangible or an item or an activity. So the individual behaves um, in order to get a preferred item or participate in a preferred activity. Or for sensory stimulation or um, automatic function. So something that um, the uh, individual will behave in a specific way that it feels good to them. Um, another way to remember these functions of behavior are everybody eats. Nice acronyms. Um, so some examples of these different functions of behavior. So an example of escape might be, I see someone that I don't want to talk to at the grocery store. So I go down the first aisle I see, um, or I buckle my seatbelt to avoid my car beeping at me. Um, an example of attention, you tell a joke because you want others to laugh and they give you attention or during dinner, um, when a friend might be, um, saying something really funny, so another friend starts imitating them to get attention. Uh, access to a tangible, we all get paid to go to work, and that's so that's pretty motivating for us to continue going to work. Um, and uh, to gain maybe sensory or pain relief, taking an Advil, getting a massage because it feels good, or running because of the runner's high. When a person gains what they want from a behavior, they're more likely to engage in that behavior again next time because they've learned that it works. So let's jump back to our previous examples and talk about the function. Um, let's see. So we said at the store, Max engaged in challenging behaviors, and so that was to gain access to the ice cream. And then in the second example, we said that Connor is screaming to get Dad's attention. Um, so like I said, everybody eats. <laughs> okay, so next we're going to talk about strategies to prevent challenging behavior and ways we can teach replacement behaviors and increase independence. With this, there are a few things to keep in mind. It's important to not only tell kids what they're expected to do and what they should or shouldn't be doing, but you should always be finding ways to reinforce the behavior you want to see. 
You want to teach the skills to help your child be more successful and less reliant on problem behavior to meet their needs. Here are some examples of way we can, ways we can do that. You could rearrange the antecedents to promote positive behavior and minimize the likelihood of problem behavior. So for example, when your child is tired, you might reduce your expectations. When you are on a full flight, you might decide to give your child more access to the iPad to prevent challenging behavior while on that flight. In everyday life, it is beneficial to find these moments where your child is communicating appropriately or engaged in a behavior that they have been learning. So this would increase the behavior we want to see and help them learn those behaviors in a more natural environment, for example, at the grocery store, in the example with Max, or um, at school, at home with their siblings. For example, an example of doing this would be uh, if Johnny was putting away his Legos and you didn't have to ask him to do that, mom could tell Johnny, great job cleaning up right away. So you're catching those moments where your child's engaging the behavior you want to see and increasing that behavior by providing the attention and positive praise. Okay, so another thing that it's very important uh, is promoting independence. So what is independence? Independence is doing things without help, occupying your own time, doing things without being told and knowing what to do next. So being independent is completing a task from beginning to end by yourself, knowing what's expected and doing that without without any prompting. Okay, so how do we teach independence? You wanna identify the goal or what you want the child to do. So you would set the goal, make sure the goal is attainable and determine the steps to the task. The first step when we are considering teaching a new skill or reinforcing a skill is what do we want the child to do? Take a moment and count how many steps there are in brushing your teeth, for example. Maybe brushing your teeth is a skill that your child is learning or they might struggle with completing that task by themselves. I can think of around seven to 10 steps and that is a lot for a four-year-old, five-year-old child. What seems like a simple task to you and I can actually be much more complicated than we realize. So the first step in deciding what tasks we wanna teach our kids to do is identifying the steps and making a goal. This is called task analysis in ABA, and task analysis is the process of breaking down a skill into smaller, more manageable steps. Okay, so after we identify what we want the child to do, then we need to identify what they can currently do. So can they do the whole task by themselves? Can they brush their teeth for the whole two minutes? Can they do most of it by themselves? Maybe they're brushing the front teeth, but not the back. Can they do two parts, like they pick up the toothbrush and put toothpaste on it? Or do they need help with the whole task? They're not, when you ask them to brush their teeth, they're not able to go get their toothbrush and get started. So to determine where they are on their level of independence, we would want to observe your, the child doing that task and decide what steps they might need help learning. Okay, so after you identify what your child can do and what you want them to do, it's time to identify how to get them there. There are a variety of strategies and tools to help prevent challenging behavior and teach new skills. Today, we're going to discuss some of these tools and show you some examples. Our goal is for you to start thinking about behavior, how to reinforce behaviors you wanna see and how to prevent challenging behavior, how to identify what supports you can use in a variety of situations to help your child be more independent. Again, as you go through these, think about your child and how you can apply these strategies. So these are all different types of support that um, in ABA and specifically at Spark, we like to use these to help promote independence. And by providing these supports, we are also preventing any challenging behavior that might occur to escape brushing their teeth because it's too difficult, for example. So visual cues, so uh, schedules, written steps, clear expectations, physical support from an adult, incentives, and self-monitoring systems. These are all different types of support you could provide, and we're gonna dive deeper into those next. Visual cues. 
So at Spark, we really can make anything a visual. Visuals are easier to fade and helps uh, the child be less reliant on you. And um, I will say they're also very fun to make. I enjoy making visuals. Many of the children we work with struggle with processing of spoken language. So visuals trigger a different area of processing and can enhance the understanding of what um, the task is. So we use visual supports, um, calendars, to-do lists, post-it notes, Google Maps. Um, those are visual supports that you see every day. Um, you'll notice that today we're going through these strategies um, involving some sort of visual, so a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so some resources that we use are Amazon, Boardmaker, Clipart, and Google. Um, we also use timers and write down um, different written things that we need to show on whiteboards. Um, and then on the slide, you can see that we have a visual that says, ask for help. So if a child um, is working on interacting with peers or um, just you know making that request to ask for help with a task at home with an adult, if you present the visual card that says, ask for help with the picture, that will prompt them to say help or help with a specific action. Okay, another visual cue is, uh, or support is schedules. So imagine you woke up every morning and you didn't know it's expected of you in your day. When you needed to be there, where you needed to be, when you were going to get coffee, you would probably start that day feeling very confused and not on the right foot to be successful. Maintaining a predictable schedule is one of the most effective ways to prevent challenging behavior. Visual schedules show kids what to expect throughout the day. You can use a schedule for the entire day or you can just break down parts of the day. For example, with brushing your teeth, you could have the whole nighttime routine in a schedule. Also, a schedule can help with transition. So if your child maybe has a hard time transitioning to brushing their teeth because they don't like doing it, you could talk about expectations before. You could set a timer for the time that they're brushing their teeth, and you could give a countdown to when they'll be done or when the next activity will be. So another um, support that we can use are written steps. So simil similar to the schedule, um, but it will break down maybe one of those specific tasks in the schedule with written steps. Um, so executive functioning is the ability to organize, plan, sequence, time manage, and prioritize information. So children with executive functioning deficits um, have some difficulty organizing information, which can lead to anxiety and confusion in completing tasks with multiple steps. Um, so like Brittany said, brushing teeth or cleaning your room has a lot of steps. So we remember the task analysis is the process of breaking a skill into smaller, more manageable steps. Um, with Even without an executive functioning, delay, we all make visual lists to help us remember everything that we need to do, whether it be, you know, a to-do list of um, different things, or um, if you have maybe a skincare routine, you might write down which uh, product you might need to use next. Um, so writing out a simple list before the event of what you want your child to do, um, and keep the list present during the activity and within sight. Um, you can point to the list when you need to give your child a reminder. Um, so the example that we have on this slide is going to the bathroom. So it's broken down into, um, I believe it's, yes, eight easy steps. So um, pull your pants or your underwear down, stand up um, to do uh, your number one business, sit down to do your number two business, um, do your business. Then you use toilet paper, then you flush the toilet, then you pull everything up, then you wash your hands, and then you dry your hands. So that takes um, kind of something that we don't think about in different steps, and we think about it as a whole, and it breaks it down into those different tasks or subtasks within one task. Okay, so another support would be setting clear expectations. There's no rule book or um, 
clear way to understand social norms or behavioral expectations. So we are often expected to pick up on other people's social cues to figure out what is expected in different situations. And some kids have a difficult time processing these cues because they struggle with the ability to take that perspective. Oftentimes children might not make the connection that their behavior triggers a reaction in other people which results in the delivery of desirable or undesirable consequences. They do not intuitively understand the social rules that certain behaviors are expected and certain behaviors are unexpected. So one way we could help provide support for this is to pre-teach expectations. It's important to teach what we want the child to do versus not what not to do. When we follow social norms and engage in behaviors that are expected, other people treat us well and respond to us with very desirable consequences. However, when we do something that's unexpected, other people react to us in ways that are less than desirable. For example, it is expected that we do not pass gas in public. That's a social norm. However, if you were sharing a conversation with someone who passed gas, you would immediately think that this kind of behavior is unexpected and you would react in a way that is less than desirable towards that person. So for example, going back to the max example, when we talked about functions of behavior, you could, if you knew that max might have a moment or cry because you denied getting ice cream, you might, before you get walk into the grocery store, talk about what's expected in the grocery store. You could even role play that scenario. So you would talk about, hey, Max, when we're walking down the ice cream aisle, you might see ice cream that you really want. And if you wanted mom to buy some, you could ask mom, hey, mom, can I get some ice cream? And then we can put it in the cart. Or if ice cream's not an option, you could discuss the alternate. So we're not going to get any ice cream today because we already have some at home. So if you see ice cream that you want, we'll have to make a different choice. Maybe we could pick something else and you can use your words to tell me um, what you would like instead. And you would get the specific words when you're discussing that expectation. And in the role play, you could pretend you're in the grocery store and role play what would be expected to say and do in that situation. So on the slide, this is uh, an example of expected meal behavior. So you would discuss this before that challenging task happens. So you would say, you know, when we're eating, we're going to sit in our chair, we're going to eat our foods, we're going to talk with our friends. If we need help opening something or cutting something, you'd ask for help. And when you're done, you clean up. And then you can act on those expectations in the moment and your child feels supported and ready to take on that task. Um, so a, another support that we use are physical supports from an adult. So when a child absolutely cannot do something independently um, because it might not be in their repertoire or is refusing, we use physical prompting. So we want to use the least amount or the least intrusive amount of prompting possible and fade our prompt as quickly as possible. So uh, we would maybe start off with a physical guide. So what that might look like is, um, let's go back to our teeth brushing example. If a kiddo physically did not know how to brush their teeth and we want to start teaching that skill using physical guiding, we might have them stand in front of the mirror in the sink um, and you would go behind them and you would hand over hand, gently hand over hand, have them brush their teeth. So um, you are, you know, teaching them that that muscle memory of, you know, brushing back and forth, up and down in circles um, as you start to teach them and then fade that physical prompt and then they can do it on their own independently. Um, in this example on the slide, um, the kiddo is receiving some physical guidance in tying her shoe, which is another um, example of something that it would be broken up into smaller tasks. Um, and use, you could use a task analysis for tying shoes as well. Okay, so another level of support would be incentives. So we've all had something that you absolutely didn't want to do. And 
you didn't want to do that task because it was difficult and challenging. But if someone offered you $100 to do it, or maybe your favorite Starbucks coffee, depending on the task, you would probably be motivated to do it. Um, motivation is strongly influenced by internal and external incentives to engage in the task and our expectations of success or failure with the task and the meaningfulness of the task. So are you motivated to do the task? Do you know how to do the task? And are you looking forward to something that's going to happen after the task? Your child might not have the intrinsic motivation to do what you want them to do. By using highly preferred items during difficult tasks, we are able to capitalize upon our kids' interests and motivate them to participate. There are a variety of ways to do this. Um, token birds is one example. So on the slide, you can see the Minnie Mouse token board. So maybe this token board is throughout the day, the child is earning tokens for playing with calm hands with their brother or sister, or asking for help when they need it. And when they get all of those tokens, they get to listen to music. So that would be the reward for the behavior you want to see and help increase motivation for them to want to do that task. Um, what else? Let's see, you could make the tasks more attainable. So if the task is really difficult, going back to what we talked about before, you could provide more support to make it attainable so that they're mo more motivated to do it. Um, earning money is another example. Maybe you have an older child and they could earn money for doing certain chores or um, completing their homework, getting a, a specific grade on test, sticker systems. So they would earn stickers towards um, a larger reward, such as going on a bike ride or maybe going to Target, whatever they enjoy. Um, another example is a first then, you can see that on the slide where it says first lunch and then outside. So this is really beneficial when you might know that a task is challenging. You could put the task that they might not be motivated to do as the first and something you know that they're going to be excited to do as the then and they know that that's coming next and they're more motivated to complete the challenging task. And lastly, another support that we use um, is a self-monitoring system. So systems that teach children how to regulate and monitor their own behavior. So you would provide your child with a cue or prompt to identify that if they engage in a specific behavior or not, um, and set a goal for reinforcement and reinforce if they reach that goal. So with these, you wanna make sure that you start small and make the goal attainable. So on the slide, we have an example of a self-monitoring system. So um, you can see that um, they have their list of their morning adventure. So the different expectations that they have for that morning and they can check off after they've done each one. Um, and you can also you know, personalize this just as much as you might, a token board to what that specific kid likes to do. Um, they might have their own point system, so they might tally um, different times they got um, praise for an expected behavior, and then after they get a certain amount of tallies, they get to engage in a preferred activity or um, get a preferred item, but it's, it's based around the child being able to regulate that and monitor that themselves. Okay, so when you are ready to teach the skill, start by setting the expectation. Make sure the expectation is clear and achievable. And make sure you give the opportunity to try before you help them. So if you were working on brushing teeth, you would give them the opportunity to do it themselves before you provide the support so that you can promote that independence. Stay positive and praise all positive behavior. So they're doing the task in an expected way. They're having a calm body and following directions. You would wanna praise all of those things as they complete that task. Children often engage in challenging behavior because they don't know how to get what they want appropriately. Engaging in the challenging behavior has worked for them in the past which is why they continue to engage in it. You should always be finding ways to reinforce your child's appropriate behaviors. Be specific when providing praise. For example, great job cleaning up when I asked you to, or going back to toothbrushing, nice job coming right away when I said it was time to brush teeth. But they won't do it. 
Uh, so um, we have to kind of remember the functions and maybe figure out why. Uh, parents control most of their children's lives. So, um, you know, making rules, setting a bedtime, chores, getting homework done, different tasks like that. But sometimes kids feel like they might have little control or choice in their own lives. So to avoid power struggles, instead of asking if they want to do something, um, tell them that this, this is the task that they're going to do or complete next, and you can put choices in there. Um, so giving them a sense of control, which motivates them to engage in the activity. So for example, if a father asked his daughter if she wanted to read with him, she immediately began crying, I want to read with mom. Instead of asking, do you want to read with me, he could have grabbed a few different books and given her the choice. So instead of saying, do you want to read with mom, he could have grabbed three different books and said, which book do you want to read with me? So then the daughter gets to choose which book she wants. <clears throat> um, make sure that there are choices that you're willing to give. For example, um, you wouldn't tell your child, do you want to eat your veggies or leave the restaurant if you're not ready to leave the restaurant? So it's a choice that's available. Um, as you're sitting here, you might even be thinking that you have the opposite problem. Your child wants to be too independent. Um, so you would avoid the power struggle by letting them do some of the task to give them that um, sense of control. Um, so for example, if a kiddo is brushing their teeth, um, she gets to brush first and then you can check her work. Um, and it's important to think about the function of the behavior and why. Are they trying to escape the task because it's too hard or are you are you, they used to you doing it for them? Um, do they need help? Do they know what's expected of them? Is the task too hard? Is there a power struggle? Or is there something that they're motivated by? Is the motivation there to complete the task? Uh, one of the most important things is to remain calm and neutral. Children can read body language and attention is attention, even negative attention. So the key to success for using reactive strategies is consistency everywhere and with everyone. So you should always respond to challenging behavior based on the function of the behavior. And a meme that we always find um, very cute, um, it's all fun and games until someone figures out the function of your behavior. Okay, keep in mind there can be multiple functions of one behavior. So um, one function would be to obtain a desired item or activity. So in this scenario, you would remove or block access to the desired item or activity. You would teach the child how to ask for the item or activity. So going back to Max and the ice cream, you would ignore the crying and pretend you don't even hear it. You continue shopping and talking to Max about other things and pick up Max if you needed to help him walk to the car. Another way that we talked about earlier would be to set that expectation ahead of time, further setting him up for independence in that moment. Um, so if the function is to get attention, we would talk about um, planned ignoring. Um, so withholding attention from the problem behavior. So not um, withholding attention from your child, but withholding attention just from the challenging behavior. So when you withhold attention, you want to avoid eye contact with the child, but continue to monitor their behavior without making it obvious that you're doing so. And also to make sure that they are in a safe environment. Um, for example, if they engage in maybe self-injurious behavior, um, don't provide any attention to the challenging behavior until your child is engaging in an appropriate behavior. Um, so you can teach the child how to appropriately get attention. So for example, you are working on homework with your child and they begin talking about how much they hate school and have no friends and hate homework. Um, instead of acknowledging those comments, you would continue to work on the homework and redirect your child's attention to their task. Okay, so another function we talked about was to escape or avoid something or someone. So if this were to happen, um, after using those proactive strategies we spoke about earlier, you could use a first then and set up 
something to help them feel motivated to do that task. So first put on your shoes, then we can pick your favorite song in the car. If this task is something the child doesn't have to do now, you can prompt the child to use their words by prompting them to say, I don't want to do this right now or something similar. So if, for example, your child was playing in the playroom and you notice that they dumped Legos out to find a specific Lego they couldn't find and you wanted them to clean that up, that's not necessarily something that might have to happen right away. So instead of engaging in challenging behavior to escape cleaning that up, you could prompt them to say, I don't want to do this right now, or can I do it later? And you could set a time to do it later. Going back to those practice strategies, maybe set a timer so they know when they're expected to clean that up. You can remind your child about what exciting theme they might look forward to next. So um, going back to the cleaning up Legos, you could say, first clean up your Legos, and then we can build a train track together. Um, so reminding them what's coming next, and that's keeping them moving forward and excited about completing the task. If the skill is difficult, you could prompt your child to ask for help and provide help by gently guiding the child to complete the task. So um, going back to maybe putting your shoes on, if your child is having a hard time getting their shoes on to go to school and engaging in challenging behavior to avoid that task, you could prompt them to ask for help because it might be too difficult and then provide that physical prompting um, as least intrusively as possible so they can be independent. Here's another example. Oh, I just talked about this one. <laughs> um, so another thing to touch on with the shoes is you could remind them what is happening next or might look forward to after putting on their shoes. So for example, first put on your shoes and then, like I said before, we're gonna listen to your favorite song in the car. You could also continue to gently help your child with the task until the task is completed and um, over time fade that prompting so that they're independent with that difficult task. Um, another function might be to gain sensory stimulation, so things that feel good. Um, so you can redirect that sensory feedback that is reinforcing the challenging behavior, or you can provide them with an alternative. Um, so something else that would be more adaptive. Uh, prompt your child to ask for maybe jumping on the trampoline or using a fidget toy. Um, so for example, while doing homework, your child starts jumping on the couch. So your child might need this sensory input or they might need a break. So you can prompt them to request a break to jump on the trampoline, um, or you can remind them that once they finish their task, so using that first then language, um, first you finish your homework and then you can go jump um, or whatever it is that their um, uh, self-stimulatory behavior might be. Okay, so these are some important considerations to keep, keep in mind when you're using reactive strategies. It's likely that that challenging behavior will increase before it gets better. So they might do it more or in a different way before it gets better, or they might do it for longer. If a child has spent years engaging in challenging behavior to get what he wants, the challenging behavior is changing that behavior is going to be difficult because it worked before for quite a long time. And so learning a new behavior and reducing that old behavior will take some time for them to learn. The key to success for using reactive strategies also is consistency everywhere and with everyone. So maybe talking to grandma about what supports you're using and what reactive strategies you're using if that challenging behavior occurs, babysitter, teacher, and involving everyone um, that's involved in that child's life so that your child can learn that skill quicker. So ABA at Spark. Um, who comes to Spark? Who benefits from ABA at Spark? Everyone, all ages and all abilities. Um, so what do we do there? We do individualized therapy, both traditional, or I'm sorry, Traditional versus naturalistic, we focus a lot on um, embedding our um, programs and targets within play um, in natural environmental settings. So, uh, and it, we work on a variety of skills where we are center based at our center um, home, community, school, and via telehealth. Um, and when 
um, two to 40 hours per week, depending on um, what, your, what kind of fits your program. So this is a visual representation of the services that we have at Spark. Um, so individual ABA, so one-to-one -one with a registered behavior technician, one-to-one -one with a board certified behavior analyst. And a lot of our sessions are being held via telehealth right now due to COVID-19. Um, but we do have a center that we just had a, a big building remodeled and it looks amazing and full of amazing fun toys. And I'm pretty jealous I don't get to play there right now. Um, we also provide group ABA. So we have our tiny sparks and little sparks um, daycare programs. We also have a kinder sparks program, um, which I think are very unique programs that both have um, children that are receiving ABA services and also peer models. So um, children who aren't receiving services um, all integrated in the same class and getting to take part in the same activities and work on a lot of that peer interaction um, and work on their goals that involve um, communicating with their peers and playing with their peers. Um, we also offer social groups. So we match a lot of clients that are in the same age or maybe interested in the same things or might have the same goals in their um, treatment program. And also, you know, similar to Tiny Sparks, but our older kiddos have that opportunity to work on their peer interaction, um, uh, social skills and communication skills. And also one of our favorites is our summer camp. We have a summer camp at Spark um, where we have, we have counselors and we still ha are providing that one-to-one -one therapy. Um, and it's a very, very fun camp setting. Um, this year we had to make some modifications, but we were still able to make it work. Um, and it was still very fun. We also have speech therapy that we offer at Spark. So we have one-to-one -one with our speech language pathologist and one-to-one -one with our speech language pathologist assistant. Um, and then we also offer training and consulting. So parent trainings, um, trainings for caregivers, teachers, and service providers. And this is to help us all be on the same page in providing um, uh, therapy for your child. And the more consistency, the better in decreasing those maladaptive behaviors and increasing the behaviors that we want to see. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming to our presentation on ABA and challenging behavior. Really hope that um, you had some takeaways that are beneficial to you and your children. And um, I am glad that we got to spend this time talking about it. Thank you.